I suggest that we start with uh, uh, our first speaker, uh, Frederike Kalteuner from Privacy International. Frederike, please. Um, thank you very much. Is that, can you hear me all right? So from discussion, if you follow normal, normal media and talk to the people that we are supposed to represent, from discussions about fake news to a hate speech, foreign-sponsored micro-targeted ads, computation and computational propaganda, it seems as if platforms, and I think it is fair to call them democracy-critical infrastructure, uh, the places in which we find and share information, in which we learn about others, mobilize and communicate, it seems as if those have been hijacked and that democracy is suffering. Um, however, I think it is important in that context to remember that just a few years ago, the narrative has been quite the opposite. Um, and with narrative, I mean the popular narrative. Foreign policy discovered, somewhat naively, the Twitter and Facebook revolutions. Um, and to some extent, I think the very idea of the internet freedom discourse is still based on the premise that a free and open internet in which individuals can freely express themselves is inherently good for democracy. I think that technological determinism is always flawed and any belief in the inherent goodness or badness of any technology is always misguided. At the same time, I think it, it would be a bit too easy uh, to merely discard all of these discussions as, as naive. I think a more painful and maybe more complex analysis would be to admit that we are beginning, only beginning to understand the inbuilt politics of advertising sponsored platforms, even though they have been around for a decade. Um, this is difficult because on the one hand, platforms are proprietary systems and are therefore opaque uh, their corporate owners have the discretion to determine what can be said and cannot be said. Um, and it's, diff it's important if we think about freedom of speech on the internet, it's not about censorship, it's about censoring what people say, but it's as important to actually be heard and be listened to than to speak in the first place. It's also complicated to understand the dynamics of platforms because these are highly complex, compli constantly evolving systems for example, the Facebook newsfeed is updated frequently, um, that increasingly rely on intelligence and automation, and to some extent there's also a moment of unpredictability where the designers and owners of these, these systems cannot fully predict its politics. So my own perspective on this is that in public debates, all of these issues are often lumped together. Fake news, which uh, has led to laws that some of the organizations in this room are fighting because they are quite problematic. Uh, fake news, filter bubbles, micro-targeted ads, all of these issues are lumped together. And what is really nice about this panel is that we have two perspectives that separate and look at very two components of these vast array of issues. And I think it is important to distinguish, on the one hand, the political biases and affordances of online platforms, so issues like filter bubbles, and on the other hand, to look at the, the role of advertisement and, and sponsored content on these platforms. These two issues are, of course, interlinked, and they have something in common, which is that we are communicating, we are learning about the news, we learn about what others feel on platforms that are completely advertisement-sponsored. And this might be what reunites these two effects that we're seeing. Um, So in our own work at Privacy International, I'm leading our program on data exploitation, and it's premised on the idea that we have to move towards an attention economy, where attention is a very scarce good, uh, a world of surveillance capitalism. Uh, so it's an economy where human attention has become a scarce and a commodity, where virtually everybody is constantly trying to hijack people's attention, both at the level of the individual and on the societal level. So I think it's also important to remember that surveillance capitalism is a form of capitalism which is most profitable to companies that have a business model that is essentially relying on tracking and surveilling their users. Okay, thank you very much, Federica, for this uh, um, kickoff uh, and, and the overview of the, some of the issues at stake. Um, Katarzyna, if you want to rejoin or... Mm -hmm. Bring your perspective. Yeah. I, uh, 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 thanks for, for, for making clear, Rocco, at the beginning that it's 
we are addressing extremely complicated issue here. It's not one issue, it's the whole array of issues that can tend to get mixed up under those uh, big headings like computational propaganda or algorithmic accountability. So maybe our key role for today is to try to unpack uh, this, 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 this mix of, of, of problems and name them <laughs> one after another. Uh, Panopticon, uh, as most of you know by now, for last eight or nine, almost nine years, uh, have ha has been active on the issue of surveillance. And for us, uh, for, 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 for a long time, uh, the, the, the key interest we had in looking at the practices of the Googles and Facebooks of this world was to find out how much they know about us how, and how, how this information is used to manipulate people. So we would not be looking at filter bubbles as problem for free speech or democracy, say, five years ago. But we were pushed by, I think, global and national politics to revisit the, the filter bubble effect that I'm sure we in this room have been aware of for quite a while, uh, including uh, what Federica described, the whole attention economy problem and the fact that we live in the internet, which is, uh, which is uh, simply, um, which suffers from the problem of, of content inflation, yes? I mean, this is something that the world in which we've been living for at least uh, 15, if not 20 years. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't frame this as a problem five years ago, but right now, after rediscovery of fake news and filter bubble as political issue, uh, at Panopticon we felt that we have to respond to uh, political concepts about what is problematic here, and uh, if we don't do that, we might wake up uh, in the world of completely sick regulation, including uh, new notice and takedown uh, regulations on fake news or prohibition of, of something, or imposing uh, Brussels imposing on, on big companies even more obligations regarding the content, which will bring even more problems on the surveillance side. So, that's basically why I'm, I'm, I'm here talking about this issue and not the typical surveillance issues that we normally uh, address. Uh, and the way we frame the, the, the fake news problem or the filter bubble problem uh, is obviously not from the fake news side, but from the side of how, um, how companies, what sort of solutions big companies offer to people who are flooded with content. Uh, how far those solutions are in line with our needs as consumers of information, uh, because it, it goes without saying for me that we have this problem. We will not escape, we cannot ignore the problem that there's too much content, right? I think this is something we live in. We've been living in uh, for, for, for quite a long time. So we have to address it. But is Facebook model of uh, filtering the content for us uh, based on non-transparent algorithms or Google's response in giving a search engine that is based, again, on a non-transparent algorithm, are those responses good enough? Or do we, as consumers of information, e want to expect those companies to deliver different solutions? Yes? So for, for me, really, the, the, the key problem is uh, not whether we profile the content, because it, it seems clear to me that we have to profile content somehow, uh, not to get flooded with irrelevant stuff. But who decides on the criteria behind this profiling and how far we, as society, can control the criteria? Because speaking openly and referring to 2015 and the fake news discovery and the political debates, if we don't control, what sort of guarantee we have that there is no third party, be that Russian botnet or Trump uh, election team or whoever, simply manipulating those algorithms in a, in, in a, man, in a, in, in a manner that uh, um, you know, gives us even less uh, control over political debate. Uh, so, so f f for me, the, 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 the crux of the matter here uh, is really the transparency of the criteria of profiling in, that shape our filter bubbles, and also the legal tools, if we have any legal tools to try to uh, have influence on this. So in Panopticon, over the last two years, we did quite a lot of investigations around this algorithmic accountability f um, uh, issues uh, in cooperation with Share Labs. We did... Uh, um, a video and, and, and artistic installation explaining Facebook algorithmic factories so or how Facebook is trying to combine our data with what advertisers on Facebook expect, how it's building profiles. Uh, I was, I, I'm still a big fan of Claudio Agosti who is in, in the Rome experiment with Facebook Newsfeed and I'm trying as much as I can to, to support projects like this to try to reveal 
in the experimental way how Facebook Newsfeed is constructed, constructed. So you know, we do those investigations, but this is to understand how, how much can we do in a legal way uh, to control. Uh, that brings me back to GDPR and our typical legal work. And here I have, uh, I have spent some time thinking about Article 22 of GDPR on automated decision making mm -hmm. and uh, the safeguards that it brings, asking myself, mm -hmm. can we use this against Facebook or to reveal uh, Facebook's way of profiling the news feed? Um, so my, my, my interpretation of this article is that it, it does give us some, um, some space to experiment uh, what we will have to prove as citizen rights advocates here is that the profiling and automated decision making certainly taking place in Facebook, that's what we know from our investigations. Facebook is most certainly using our personal data to profile the content and is done in an automated manner, yes? Both for advertising, that Jeff will, will we explain more, and both for the filter bubble effect, so the, the shape of our news feed. That goes without saying, and we have enough evidence to prove that Facebook will not argue against it. The, the, the one missing criteria that we, ha we would have to prove to get more transparency in a legal way is proving that this automated decision making, so the fact of what gets, makes its way to newsfeed, what not, might have significant impact on our life. Mm -hmm. That's where, where the problem starts. Can we prove that point? If it's the advertising of the new president, uh, it might be the case. If it's the advertising, sorry, I use advertising in a, in a, in a, in a broad way. If it's the, the sponsored content or the, the news about the potential new president, I might prove that point. If it's just news about the weather or it's uh, random, random sponsored content about shoes or whatever, new diet, it might not be the case. So we are entering a really a uh, hell lot of gray zone, which might end up, uh, even if we end up in a court case, it will not be a general rule on Facebook. It will rather be a specific judgment on specific case of specific content that made its way to my newsfeed or not. So my point here is I'm not very optimistic about our possibility of using Article 22 of GDPR to actually force Facebook and similar companies to reveal the logic behind profiling. But what we could do, we could try to use general principles of the GDPR, so Article 5, on, uh, that mentions transparency as one of the principles, uh, data minimization principle, purpose limitation principle, to attack the way uh, newsfeed works anyway <laughs> and force them to actually uh, be much more detailed in their communication about profiling. Uh, the last, last week, yes, was it last week or two weeks ago, when Zuckerberg announced uh, finally the end of experiment and the new era of uh, uh, of, of for in Facebook algorithmic world, so the, the change of algorithms to allegedly limit our exposure to fake news. You, you know the debate is going on. Many people disagree with that uh, intention, uh, claiming that it's the opposite. Facebook wants to get even more money from advertisers, and that's the only actual uh, logic behind this change. It only confirms the point that as long as we are not in position as society to get all the criteria, we will still be gained by, by, by those companies making statements they like about how they will tweak the argument, uh, the, the algorithm, with what effect, without actually our ability to confirm or, de or deny uh, those claims. Yes, All we can do is say, no, Mark, we disagree with your, uh, with your position. We have no scrutiny. We have no ability to check what they actually change and what's the actual effect on our newsfeed of the change they made. Uh, so it only confirms to me that it should be our major fight as the network this year. We should work really hard to find a good strategic case to start litigating on this and test how far we can go with GDPR to open uh, the logic behind the filter bubble. I'm Jeff Chester, Center for Digital Democracy and a member of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. Um, I absolutely agree. And the reason I'm here is to work with you and our colleagues to figure out what can be done. And I think for many of us, the only hope we have is the GDPR because what you've seen in the last, you know, let me just say as you were talking, politics, political advertising has now just become quote unquote a vertical for Facebook and Google. It's treated just like 
junk food marketing, financial marketing, retail marketing. It's a it's a vertical. And what this what, what uh, do you mean by vertical? Well, when when the ad people come out and sell you ad services, right? And they're and, and they're, you, they'll they'll say, oh, you're a bank. We can do financial marketing, right? Uh, you're a fast food company. And, and look, you go to Think with Google and look at Think with Google. Uh, uh, EU, think with Google uh, UK, think with Google APAC, think with Google US, and you look at all the examples, and go to Facebook IQ, the, the site for, uh, Facebook has for its advertisers, and just see what they say the platform does, and can do, and will do. Mark Zuckerberg has a whole agenda, 2020, it's called 2020 on Facebook IQ, oh. about how they'll be able to use mobile to influence this even more. What this underscores, the, the, the controversies that have, and we're glad the controversies finally erupted with Russia Gate and Brexit, is the failure to regulate the commercial advertising system, especially one developed in the United States. This was always part of the problem to, to begin with back in 1990 when the internet became commercial. It was always going to be shaped by the force, the, by the U.S. system of advertising and marketing. And it, it's been un, largely unregulated. And, and it is a global system. You know, it operates here in many ways the same as it operates everywhere else in terms of its, of its capabilities. And so it's not, it's not surprising that, that th this finally became a problem because as Google and Facebook and others, but they're the principal architects of this system, as they develop this kind of 21st century real-time data-driven system that combines surveillance with uh, digital advertising formats and techniques designed to shape and change people's behavior, the industry calls it quote unquote action, action, actionability, despite the fact that privacy advocates in the EU and privacy advocates in the United States, like Mark Rotenberg and Center for Digital Democracy and other groups said, wait a second, this is upset. this programmatic real-time system needs safeguards. They didn't develop any safeguards. They didn't want to develop any safeguards. And it was only because of the controversies that broke out over the Russian interference with the election Right and, and and Congress being concerned about it, our Congress being concerned about it, that they finally admitted there was some some problem. So we have to get to this issue of the role that these big data platforms and the big data uh, digital marketing economy is playing in our in our elections, certainly in the United States, and in shaping political ideas. Because the system is about to become more powerful, and already the political specialists are working on it. AI, VR, Internet of Things. So look, what, just quickly, what we've been looking at. Because what was so fascinating for us was that in 2016, and let me just say, what Trump's campaign manager said, Brad Perscale, uh, when, you know, uh, in, uh, on a t television interview a few months ago, he said, we just used all the tools that the digital advertising industry makes available. And I always thought Trump, the Trump people did it the best because he was an ad guy, this Brad Perscale. He wasn't a political guy, and he understood what this system could do. And he understood that between 2012 and 2016, because there was no regulation, no oversight by the federal, because the US does not have a, a privacy law except the law that my NGO and Catherine Montgomery's in the audience got passed in 1998 on children, which you couldn't get passed today. There's no privacy regulation in the United States. The Federal Trade Commission has absolutely no authority to do anything at all. So what's happened the last few years, and what did the political parties use? Well, Bernie Sanders, okay, and Donald Trump, they used the data clouds, this massive consolidation of information uh, that, that has been created over the last few years, right, by Oracle and others. That's one-stop shopping for hundreds of data sources. They use identity, ma identity management systems, which Facebook and partners made possible. They now talk about curating the identity of individuals. They, in, because of the mobile device, not only do they have our geolocation, but as you know, they now are able to do cross-device identification and tracking because it's very important they're able to target. A, I said, we were supposed to do five minutes. Intro. Yeah, so we can I, have will, time. I will. I will. I will we, soon intervene. So, 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 so. That's why I'm rushing, going quickly. I apologize. The, 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 they were so concerned um, about the role that the mobile device played 
uh, in people's lives that they, they realized they had to invest to link together all the devices, principally so they could service video-based advertising. So they're now able to track you on all your older devices. The programmatic advertising system, this real-time system that's able to target you wherever you are, and which increasingly is able to change the message that's called programmatic creative based on your behavior, is now part of this, of, of this, of this system. So there's no safeguards in this very powerful system that is being used to sell us health services and junk food and, and groceries and, and enter, entertainment is now been totally unleashed in the political sphere. And uh, there's no restraints, no constraints, and we need to do something about it. Now, even with Obama there, we got nothing really from the US government in terms of addressing the, 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 the commercial sphere. Regulating the political sphere is harder, as you know, because of our, our First Amendment, but it's also because the companies have had a lock, Google and Facebook, who have built very significant businesses. If you haven't looked at, I'm sure you all have, if you haven't looked at, um, uh, go to Think with Google and look at politics and you'll see all the work they did in 2016. You know, amazing infrastructure because they were selling candidates uh, 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 their services. And as you know, both Facebook and, and Google allowed the political parties send people to work to, uh, directly with the political parties to give them access to the full range of tools. Okay, to make a long story short, you have this, this very powerful system this designed to, uh, this constantly collecting all our information that has no regulatory limits at all, that's now being applied in the, in the political sphere, you know, uh, it's being used all over the world, and if someone's going to stand up and say there have to be limits, I think it has to be coming from the EU and the GDPR. Okay, thank you very much. I Take your clap. Frederica. I forgot to say our conclusion at the beginning. <coughs> oh, please. Um, <laughs> so I think the reason why I framed this a little bit more carefully at the beginning is that this is the, maybe the most pressing, one of the most pressing issues of our time, but it's, you easily end up with strange bedfellows, and they are anything from, let's ban fake news, to a single company rigged the election, and it's all Russia's fault, which is, it's more complicated. That's why I framed it a bit more carefully. And I think the solution we found to navigate this space is to say the underlying cause is the advertisement-driven internet. You can fight about whether advertisement in and of itself has significant effects on individual, but it's fueling an ecosystem that is increasingly being tapped into by actors that have nothing to do with advertisement. Cambridge Analytica bought their data commercially in the US market. There was like the same foreign actors can do the same. Anybody with very limited resources can tap into yes. an ecosystem and target very specific messages to people um, using or hijacking that, that ecosystem. And one of the things we're working on is, on the one end, I think it is important to notice the global nature of this, especially in countries like Kenya, where we did an investigation with zero data protection laws um, at all, so I think it is, important to still advocate for basic laws and protections. Um, the second thing we're doing is, it is interesting to look at profiling and automated decision making. I agree, I'm very pessimistic about Article 22's applicability. Mm. At the same time though, um, it is also important to notice that a lot of these information about us are inferred and that this is profiling, which will become significantly more difficult and our avenue to challenge the system is to not focus on the platforms themselves, even though we have to ask what are their responsibilities. For example, in our Facebook uh, Kenya investigation, why is Facebook, uh, why is Facebook showing hate, like violence inciting advertisements that are targeted in a country like Kenya? I think we can ask sort of like what responsibility does Facebook have? But our angle is to, on the one hand, focus on profiling in the GDPR, and on the other hand, focus on the data broker industry. So the data, the industry that drives this ecosystem is beyond the platforms, and challenge whether they are compliant with the law post GDPR. And I think many will be in trouble if consumers start withdrawing consent, or if we really test and investigate whether they have obtained all their data and are processing it lawfully. That's just. Thank you very much. Uh, before giving back the floor to the speakers, I would like to already open the floor um, and I see a few questions. Um, we will spend the rest of the time asking questions. So Not I'll questions, really discussing, I guess. Or discussion.
question to each other also. <laughs> ah, good. I like that spirit. Um, let's start. I'll take a couple of questions, a couple of interventions, <laughs> proposition, <laughs> and uh, and we will follow up. I'm George from Share Foundation. Uh, I take a couple of uh, ideas about Article 22. In fact, I'm concerned not so much with the uh, uh, condition of significantly affecting the person, but the condition of produce, that profiling is producing legal impact. So it's or, it's not and. Either or. You, can, you don't have to prove both. That would be impossible, of course. There is no legal impact, but it's uh, fortunately there is no end. Mm -hmm. It's all. It's alternative. That's why we don't even refer to legal okay. impact. Yes. Yes. Great. Then I'm fine because <laughs> <laughs> we sold one. Yes. I, I really think that we can argue that uh, uh, there is a significant effect because of the based on the uh, market research of how much we use these services, how much they are used by regular people in order to, to get information, to be informed and so on, and that there is a lot of, lot of reasons to say that there is significant effort on the mass population. Unfortunately, it's kind of defined, at least the Article 29 Working Party, they come up with examples like, you lost money, you lost health, you lost job, you know, like those kinds of concrete impacts on the individual. And then it gets tricky. It, it's not like societal effect where we could make this point with a lot of research we have on how deep Facebook goes into our lives and how much we depend on it. If we go that way, that would be easy. But uh, I think, unfortunately, the GDPR, that therefore it's legal effect or similar significant effect. So it is supposed to be a concrete effect on you as individual in your life that we would have to prove. Okay, so we can so it, do more research on that. Uh -huh. <laughs> You know, and I, th I th and, and I haven't looked into it, but the fact that Zuckerberg is going to put all the ads up there, and I don't think in response to this uh, pr pressure, right, um, and one reason, of course, they're, they're responding is the advertisers have been very unhappy with Google and Facebook about all this, but it would be very important to do an independent analysis of all the election ads. I mean, they claim they're going to put all the election ads up. There'll be a database. I doubt whether they're going to talk about the techniques and the targeting and the extent that needs to be uh, 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 done, but you could analyze that and see if, in fact, it's, it's, they're being accurate. Um, please. Uh, I'm of Cambridge University. Um, so, as to Article 22, it is interesting also to compare it with the Data Protection Directive and see how now it's more narrow in that element of the significant effect. Because before it was legal or otherwise uh, significant effect. Now it's similar, similarly significant effect, it must, which means similar to a legal effect. Mm -hmm. So, it's more narrow, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And then I was wondering. Uh, what do you think of the research by Fletcher and Nielsen of the, I don't know which thing, uh, which essentially claims with a lot of empirical data that the filter bubble doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Social media use is fairly associated with incidental exposure to, uh, to additional sources of news that people otherwise wouldn't use and with more politically diverse news diets. Uh, I was wondering what are your thoughts about this? And if I can uh, rejoin and, and and relaunch the discussion. Uh, the filtering presupposes the fact that you are open to, to receive whatever kind of information. I, I wonder whether this is the right metaphor to use mm -hmm. when we speak about that, mm -hmm. because uh, I have the feeling that uh, there is a presumption that uh, um, the, 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 the individual, the citizen, mm -hmm. is a fundamentally idiot and yeah. can only do what has been said by is a Facebook feed. So like uh, the, the citizen can be looking for alternative uh, things or not, like uh, can be a recipient for much more or can be even an active agent in, in this situation and not only the victim of, uh, of a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ah, okay. Well, we are I, I think it is. Oh, do you want to collect questions? No, please, please, please. Uh, those we already things are very difficult to study. Um, at the previous discussion, <coughs> Sunny mentioned an example, uh, a study that studied the effect of fake news on individuals. 
And what is interesting about this study is that it doesn't study, so it looks at, as each individual, how many fake news have they seen? Um, and the conclusion was, well, it doesn't have a significant effect. Um, and as much as I'm against any regulation on fake news, I think it is more complicated because you have to see, most people are not on Twitter, uh, but influencers are, politicians right. are, journalists are, um, and the same with bots. Of course, we're not being individually, Im Im we're not being um, manipulated by bots. People are not stupid, but it's very difficult to scientifically study and measure the effects of such things that are interrelated and complex on, for example, a shift of discourse. Why was the alt-right in the US given so much attention? Why was there so much uh, media coverage on uh, the alternative yeah. in Germany? Because there are these networks effects, there's, uh, yes. it's very complicated and it's very difficult to study. I haven't seen good studies on the existence of these interrelated phenomena. And if you have some, please send them my way. But it is very tricky to study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know the research you refer to, so I cannot comment, but even you know, as a lawyer and not sociologist or anthropologist, I would be very careful in making statements like filter bubbles exist, they don't exist, they have impact, they don't. In fact, I care less about this. I think they are very interesting research questions. I have nothing against people researching them, but for me as a lawyer and civil rights advocate, it's more important to uh, advocate for the need for us to control the profiling criteria regardless. I mean, even if we can be quite, um, even if we feel safe as society, the filter bubble effect is not as powerful as, as it's been presented uh, 10 years ago, might be the case. Or even if we never had different life before, because we were always profiled, we, uh, correct, let me correct it, not profiled, but we were always exposed only to certain narrow uh, political agenda because we all, in the past, we only read one newspaper, maybe, right? It's, it doesn't diminish the problem of manipulation. So even if I'm comfortable with the fact that citizen, myself, anybody, is choosing to live in a filter bubble of his or her, cho her choice, I have no problem with this, or I have no problem with argument that maybe filter bubbles are less powerful than what some researchers might think, still I think we have serious problem of manipulation. Yes, so there are two separate discussions for, for me. I guess the point here is that I want to be able as individual to choose my bubble and sit in, in, in this bubble and say I'm happy to have those four sources of information only. Cool, but if it's my choice, I'm okay with this. It was, if it was Facebook's choice and I don't understand how it was made, I'm not comfortable. So it's not the filter bubble as a problem, but the criteria behind shaping, shaping it for, for, for me. Yes, that's why I care less about uh, those findings. Okay, there was, please, um, and I'll collect a few. If they're on the same topic, please just do this. So I know that the true finger. I think I'll keep going about the fake news uh, Thing of brain uh, I've always been a bit uncomfortable with the fake news thing. My, my, my thought process is not complete on the topic because I have not had time to think a lot about it. But for me, I feel like like the governments, they, they became uh, um, annoyed by the fake news because it felt like they've lost the monopoly of, of putting out fake news. But that's my feeling about it. By which I mean, like, if you look at in the past and if you look, for instance, at the United States, you know, what happened um, during the Vietnam War, or what happened during the uh, Yugoslavian War uh, in the Balkans, or lots of, of like, fake information put out mm. by the governments. Uh, this has happened, not forever, but like, for a long time. And it just feels like suddenly, because it's all about the Russians, or this kind of thing, like, it becomes a topic we need to do something about and feels like it's actually going to be a pretext to control information even more. And I feel like this is going to, to go towards more control and more um, uh, loss of trust from the public towards what they read. Because I think people kind of know or feel that, that you know, we're lying to them. And I think this is because governments have lied already quite a lot. And, and I think this is going to go even more t in the direction of, of yeah, lack of trust in whatever you read and eventually you can publish anything and people can believe in anything because they won't trust anything anymore because of all the filters. I mean, to me, this also raises the other issue, or one of the other issues that needs to be addressed, which is being addressed in part, but, but about the impact that the digital advertising system has had on news and information. 
because what it's allowed to happen is it is given a revenue source to, to, to sources of information that are purely, purely ideological, like Breitbart News, which played a big role in, 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 in Trump's election. And uh, Google and Facebook, Google especially, has been funding all of, all of these uh, ideologically driven uh, sources and classifying them really as, as, as news when they are, they are not. So we need to look into that as well. They have a lot to do with undermining uh, the digital uh, journalism economy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as long as news are treated as any other commodity without difference, that's right. right. We will be always coming to the money problem. A small comment on what you said. Um, one is, I think, what is new is that you're able to target these messages to very precise audiences, and anybody can do that. And I think that is quite scary for, mm -hmm. without anybody noticing. Mm -hmm. One thing. And the second thing is, <laughs> no, please, no, 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 I, I have a, a comment on what you just said, but no, no, please uh, finish. And the second one is, I think there's the, on criteria also that are profiled, so they might, may or may not be correct. Let's, let's. Let's get this straight. And the, uh -huh. the other comment is, I, I think I, I, I understand your sentiment. And it is interesting. We would not be talking about this issue had Trump not won, I think. And the technology would be the same. At the same time, though, what I might find most interesting is, is that there are business models in basically clickbaiting. That because the internet is based on yeah. targeted advertisement, there is an incentive for People have no interest in politics at all to put out random facts, whatever makes people click and angry, and this distra distracts uh, attention, and this distracts the discourse. And we're talking about something which is fake, that nobody, you can observe these very strange dynamics online. They're understudied, they're very complex. And I think this is the core of, of the newness of the problem. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. We are much more, we should be much more concerned about digital capitalism ra than, than, than GDPR or privacy issues here. I mean, if we could solve the biggest problem, which yeah. is specifically the commodification of content, like, uh, we yeah. would solve this as well. Uh, but yeah. I'm not sure if we can get this done in this room today, hopefully some 10 years from yeah. now. Uh, just a side comment on, on, on what you said about that everybody can target. We did a, a little experiment last year. Uh, trying to target a uh, Facebook audience uh, using those sophisticated mechanisms ourselves and do the same with Google uh, Google um, AdWords and we failed. We couldn't as NGO cooperating with advertising people. We didn't have enough data, third party data to do this. Uh. Uh, uh, but I'll ask you about that because I'm very interested. But I, I, there were two interventions that were two finger interventions. Um. Particularly interested in the regulation of these things, and I think one of the interesting areas about studying electoral advertising is that we have two very, very uh, different regimes for electoral advertising, particularly for broadcast electoral advertising. We have a very strict regime that controls the. Well, I'm talking about Europe. I mean, we're talking, we're not, we we, we know that. <laughs> um, so we have a very strict regime across Europe, and, and uh, the typical <coughs> international competence, but with some. Uh, European rules as well. When it comes to advertising, the European Commission constantly gives platforms to the advertising industry to champion how effective self-regulation is, yeah. and how wonderful and what a standout example of self-regulation it is. And I plead some guilds as having been part of the European Community of Practice on co and self-regulation, which the advertising industry descended upon um, and turned into a kind of uh, platform for them to say how great self-regulation is. So we have one extreme and the other extreme. <laughs> and when we talk about generic advertising, because one of the points about fake news is that we see the leaching away from electoral advertising into a much mm. more generic form, you have these two regimes which do not speak to each other. And so I think that in practical terms, if you actually want to do something, you're facing a very, very large obstacle between two communities that don't talk to each other, two types of legal regime which are entirely opposed to each other. And I will just note a couple of things. The, the head of the fake news high level community of experts, that's what we call any community in Europe, but, uh, people from the US. So we all, always call them high level and we always call them experts. But it's actually led by an expert, an expert on broadcasting law, uh, the head of the Netherlands regulator, um, who's terrific. And I, I think she may come out with something really, really useful, but it's coming from broadcasting. So be aware of that. And second point is that we can worry a lot about social media. The, the most obvious uh, problem we had in the UK with electoral advertising is that the editor of the Daily Telegraph, the largest real newspaper, 
On election day 2015, sent an email to all of the email addresses they had to subscribers, half a million people telling them to vote Conservative, and that it was the most important election since 1979. Of course, he was right about that, because the following year we then got Brexit. Um, but that's you know, a really, really extreme example of abuse of, uh, of online uh, advertising, um, for which he was fined £30,000 a couple of months ago, um, which seems not exactly to not fit the crime. So I just want to comment on the fact that in practical terms, if we want to regulate this, we're facing a huge problem of the broadcasting world, and I, I recognize that most people probably don't do a lot of broadcasting law, but it's really worth examining, versus a world of self-regulation in which the government takes a back seat. Mm. There was not, b before, uh, there was another, yeah. it, if it's it in the uh, same... It was pretty much uh, what I was going to say. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, extending to the... the, the right, yeah. That, yeah, but uh, I think you can also extend it to the control over political expenditure. What you're seeing in the UK right now, I mean, obviously, the UK is one of the countries that, since Brexit, is going to absolute shock as to what could happen. You know, now the right is worried about Jeremy Corbyn. You don't know, you know the insurgent left, you know, taking over the country and nationalizing everything. So they're really in a panic about, you know, whether the internet can, you know, subvert the political process. But I think there's a big debate as to what point the Electoral Commission should actually be controlling the budgets. And there is now appearing, like, there are several cases where dark money and there's of course the suspicion on Russia, you know, yeah, it's yeah. always lurking there, but just the idea that it's actually really impossible to control expenditure online, and that's why you see lots of money going under, while with the traditional advertising, you know, apart from having control over the content, you have more control over how money is spent, and there's just no way of tracking, you know, like uh, ad impressions online, also because in the real commercial world, half of ad impressions are fraudulent, and they're actually money that's been stolen from companies, so, you know, if you translate that to political I, I do think, for talking about the, in the United States, the first place, I hope that you will come Thursday at 8.30 in the morning, moder a panel on the, these issues where uh, the representative from the UK ICO uh, will be joined by other, uh, other folks and moderated by Anna Fiedler, uh, who's in the audience, and it's a panel sponsored by my organization and the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. I know for the US that the regulators both the so-called data regulators and certainly the uh, media regulators know nothing about how online advertising works. And I think we have an opportunity in the United States, I'm sh I'm sh uh, perhaps it's same here, maybe not, to use this controversy to educate the policymakers, the government, the public about the, the mechanisms, the techniques of the online advertising system that's been created to really help, help them understand how it works, where it's going. I mean, it's not a secret in the, inside the industry, but it does seem to be something that the um, regulators need to know much more about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Can I comment quickly on, on, no. on, on that? Uh, we, we, as I said, we did quite yes. some research yes. around those topics the last two years, including closed seminars with advertising people and legal yes. experts, yes. also from the broadcasting industry, to try to come up with some solutions. And honestly, most of them told me it's completely futile to try to use the old broadcasting regulations to political micro-targeting in social media because there's so many ways of circumventing, I mean, so many ways of, uh, of uh, detaching the political agent here from the actual message. Uh, and I think the point has been also proven in UK after Brexit, right? The Guardian investigation proved beyond any doubt that there was the money, the political money was involved, yeah. there was clear goal in convincing people, and yet there is no way of using legal measures against the real agents here. Uh, plus, oh, we are not... Sorry, that second part is not necessarily part of it. No? <coughs> okay, so yeah. I will be yeah, happy yeah, to yeah. hear more about yeah. the consequences. But I mean, the electoral regulations being useless, but that doesn't yeah. mean the regulations themselves can't actually be adapted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, but so so so, but that difficulty also in in linking messages to political parties uh, is related to the fact that we are not talking about open advertising here, right? About vote me Trump, but about generated content that might support, say, Trump or Brexit agenda, but is not clearly his or or that team's advertising. So it's, it's even more complicated. And, and I think therefore we were d discussing more the privacy laws, whether if we cannot effectively limit or forbid this type of unethical political advertising can we help people to to g basically get more impact on uh, more control on the individual level our thinking was okay maybe voters can be motivated 
by us to simply try to learn more about those systems and use their personal data protection rights to control what they are, uh, how they are targeted, if we cannot attack this from, yes, from the public regulation side. I, I, I don't make the point that it's mutually exclusive. We can try both strategies, but I think they are both valid strategies on coming to similar effect of more societal control over this. There may be a time issue. Uh-huh. Uh, just two comments. I think profiling is more interesting than automated decision making because in order to know whether somebody is conservative or liberal, those are sensitive information and they're usually not provided by most people. Most people don't tick a box and fill out a form yeah. to say on Facebook, I'm conservative. Yeah. You use uh, increasingly sophisticated uh, techniques um, from big data analytics to machine learning to infer that you're probably conservative, you're probably yeah. liberal, etc. And this is profiling. Uh, if we can stop it. But sort of well, like you can't just profile sensitive categories post GDPR. That's, that's become right. significantly more important, uh, more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, this applies to most of the categories of data that data brokers sell have been profiled. They are not information that people have provided. So I think there's a lot of room to work on to yeah. work this angle. Mm -hmm. And the second comment I want to make, I would love to read the study you did, the test where you tried to buy targeted advertisement. Let me qualify. When I said everybody can tap into this, I meant everybody with money. Yeah. And democracy money. is not just elections. Democracy mm. is also what happens outside of election. Right. And the most fascinating case we came across recently, I came across recently, I think was not targeting in elections, but um, Saudi, Arabia's, Saudi Arabia's targeting of anti-Qatar messages <laughs> to people around the world. Yes, yes, yes. So we're seeing things which is, this is next level, this is yeah. not just election targeting, right. this yeah. is diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What I'm also worried about <coughs> is international corporations have an interest uh, when, when a social movement, let's say an environmentalist movement uh, is happening mm -hmm. to target politicians and mm -hmm. activists, one of our partner organization in Mexico has been surveilled, um, or people in Mexico have been surveilled, um, and the context was a sugar tax. There's so much money involved in so many issues, and anybody with money can, can micro-target, this is just very troubling, and I think election laws only get us so far. The core of this is the fact that this is even possible, mm. and if it's under-regulated, anybody with enough money and enough data uh, that can be bought can tap into this. Okay, I'll, I'll, many interesting things are already emerging, but I see like a, a few hands that are <coughs> since a while. You were... Uh, no, my question was... Uh, a bit louder? Uh, my question was referring to the discussion we had uh, some time ago here in this panel. I'm Natalia from the European Data Protection Supervisor's Office. And specifically on the guidelines of the Working Party 29 providing them to make a decision making. And to your knowledge, were there any submissions made in the formal or informal consultation process that would speak to uh, maybe expanding the definition of the other significant consequences or the interpretation yes. of the Working Party to account for uh, the possible negative effects of micro targeting? And what feedback did you receive from all of you on that? We, we submitted one. On, um, we submitted one. I'm happy to share this. I'm not sure if we mentioned advertisement, but we clearly made the point that advertisement has significant effects. And the argument I think we used was the example, if you're, if you're classified as female or male, or that woman, if you're classified as female, you don't see advertisement for higher paying jobs. Mm. Um, however, you don't know whether you're classified as male or female. So there's the potential of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know whether I have been discriminated because the ads are targeted. So we phrased it and said, this is an inherent risk of personalized advertisement. Discrimination is an inherent risk, which is why there are significant effects. I'm not sure if that's a good argument, but we try to make that in the submission. So Yes, so we didn't mention politics, but I think this is also a good argument for significant effects. Okay, the next question, Anna? Um, I, I was doing the same comments as having a colleague behind, so... Okay, okay. Uh, Therese, please, first. I don't know your name, so sorry. I'm saying that before I'm this, my question would probably give 
that way. Um, I was wondering if there is any um, motivation or any kind of uh, backing towards creating some technical solutions. So you mentioned that people people might be worried about you know how they are being uh, targeted or how they're being profiled, and there could be like systems built on top of Facebook or on top of Google where you could log in and understand how Facebook or Google is targeting you. And um, you know you could use the same ad platform to figure out the people who might be most susceptible to these kind of targeting. It's kind of weird because you're using their own system to, to kind of try and defeat them. I wonder if these kind of efforts have been made and if, um, if there is any, I don't know, um, if you think that this could be something that could help. I think this answer. Please. The things I was going to state is my experience in making a tool that is exactly uh, addressing this problem. So both uh, algorithm as a personal, as a personalized experience or uh, target advertising, uh, they are different, difficult to be judged because uh, everybody see only one perception of the reality. One of the way to uh, understand if you are discriminated or if, uh, if you are really kept uh, in a bubble is uh, if I can compare my experience with uh, your own or if we can do it collectively. So the experiment uh, run uh, is based on a browser extension because uh, you join uh, willingly installing this tool that uh, monitor for you your online, do a personal copy of what you saw and then and then open the problem. Because if you can see your own uh, recordings, uh, you can start to understand uh, how to enter. If you want to compare it with other person, it may lead to some kind of privacy problem. So what we are working on is a uh, framework of uh, privacy preserving uh, analysis. But uh, some of the analysis that can be done can be uh, already actionable. For example, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that uh, the uh, Facebook algorithm is going to change and show less news. We have uh, one year of uh, recordings uh, from uh, more than 1,000 users. So it's possible to do statistics on uh, media source, uh, how much they were appearing in the past, how much they will appear in the next month, and uh, do some assessment. So those kind of approaches uh, exist. Uh, there are difficulties, especially because uh, mm, running the technology and having data analysis and having a good uh, uh, marketing vector to have a, a very diverse set of users to observe the, the network are different difficult tasks uh, I'm alone. But if you want to join, <laughs> you're welcome. Can I respond for a second? Very briefly. Just so I, I think that in trying to address this problem, we also have to look at the nature of digital advertising. And it's more than just the data, the data collection, although data collection is at, at the core. First place, it's now cross-device in real time. It is following you and, and, and changing. It's being designed to tap in to your unconscious. So look at what Facebook has done with norm, neuromarketing, for example. It's designed to be immersive. It's designed to be shared through the role of influences. So it has a, 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 a far greater impact than one would imagine, you know, uh, just counting the ads and, 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 and seeing what the impact is. Okay. That's why it needs to be regulated. That's why these systems need to be regulated. Kevin. Yes, uh, my question is connected somehow to the, to the previous two uh, interventions. Um, my impression is that the, uh, <clears throat> that the diagnosis is more or less clear, but if we try to find therapies for the situation, maybe it's hopeless, <laughs> but let's try. Uh, uh, what you mentioned so far was uh, Regulation, legal guarantee, self-regulation, um, uh, awareness raising, uh, understanding from the part of the, of the individual. But what is your opinion about the existing technical, technological IT tools, which are not very complicated. Of course, they are not competitors of Google. But if you don't use Google, but you use Dogdog or whatever, if you don't use Facebook, but you go to an alternative social network, these are not competitors. And it will not solve the problems of the whole of the what's, what's your opinion? Can they be used for something, or is just a you know, kind of, uh, mm -hmm. buzzword uh, in GDPR about the privacy by design and privacy enhancing mm -hmm. technology? So, what's your opinion on this? Mm -hmm. This is a very good question. Well, yeah, I mean, if we think of alternatives, 
No, I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic. I don't think that using alternatives, it might be cool in our bubble, but it will never yeah, exactly. help us solve the big social political problems because they are of, of, of mass scale. I mean, precisely we have problem with Facebook, not because we love it or we use it heavily, I hope, but because everybody else is, is there. And if we are concerned about political impact of, say, micro-targeting on Facebook, it's not because of us, who can go to alternative service, but because of the society. So, no, I, I don't think that going after alternatives in, in tech terms will solve those problems that we are discussing today. I prefer to try and use GDPR principles, including privacy by design, the principles like data minimization, apply them to Facebook or to Google or to big data brokers so that the societal effect of, of this application is, 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 is higher. Uh, and then if I may uh, get back to, to, to your really interesting point, I would love to have such a tool. I mean, if we can find a way of building application level up above Facebook without Facebook, Facebook uh, denying us access to data, that would be super cool. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to spend some time in the break discussing this possibility because my understanding so far was that apart from legal ways of forcing them to reveal my profile on the grounds of GDPR, I cannot force them to do that. Yes, and uh, also the problem... If yeah. I may ask you a clarification about that, because uh, I think it was something that uh, popped up about, uh, you were mentioning also about the um, implicit profiling. Like, uh, it's not on Facebook that I will see that I'm... Um, a young woman uh, conservative that apparently what I am on Facebook according yeah. to a different company yeah. Yeah. that is extracting yeah. uh, the exactly. data from Facebook. Exactly. So if I go to Facebook and actually I think that Facebook has this online page where you can check more or less what are my preference or more or less explicitly but I, I don't see what is juicy for, for a political party, maybe, or yeah. not? It's, it's an open question. I don't know enough yeah. the, no, no, the no, platforms. No, no. I, I, I'm glad to expand on this. From my experience, we exactly tried to do this research. And I also know that ProPublica in the US uh, did a lot of data mining on Facebook to prove how many real categories exist. ProPublica, in their, uh, in their experiment, went up to, uh, I think, 17,000 categories. Uh, which the number of categories that Facebook presents to us is maybe 20. I, mean, I might be wrong on numbers, but it's, it's completely out of proportion. So the actual knowledge, uh, the inferred knowledge about us on Facebook itself is maybe 100 times bigger than what it currently shows us. That's one problem. And we have to find a way of forcing Facebook to reveal the whole picture. Second problem, both of you named it, uh, it's usually uh, the, the actual targeting in real time happens as a result of real time combi combining in real time knowledge from many sources, correct? Yes. Right. So to get those all those sources mm -hmm. in GDPR, mechanism will be super difficult. But, no? can I, but can I add, this is where Facebook is always disingenuous because in fact the way to understand in part Facebook's real data apparatus is to look at their preferred partners. And you can go to Facebook preferred partners which is part of their ad system and scroll down for your country. And you, so for the example in the United States, right? Facebook doesn't tell you, oh, by the way, our preferred data partners are the Oracle Marketing Cloud, Axiom, the most powerful data brokers on the planet. They don't say you can control that information, which has all our political and other information on them. And they should be held accountable, since they, in fact, are working with Facebook and it's part of the profiling, held accountable under the GDPR, I suggest. Just building on this, I think, for public relations, or it, we should maybe talk less about Facebook and, and draw attention to this. If you do a data request, to a company like Axiom, um, or this was like Paul, who's going to be on your panel on yeah. Thursday. It is he did it to, for a different data broker, and they have categories like your romantic type. Are you somebody who falls in love quickly or no. slowly? <laughs> How passionate are you, etc. And I think this this is all of this is profiling. It is all of this is profiling, and the other thing also is like we also have to talk data brokers buy, buy sources, not all data originates from Facebook. That's a common, we all know this, but if you talk to journalists, that's a common misconception. Loyalty card data, public registries, all of these are fed into a system. So there's like the offline, online distinction is a lot more blurred than, than it sometimes seems. And, and, and because, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask if you can share with everybody, it might be interesting what kind of identifier can be used with those companies. I also tried asking them with my email and it didn't work. I think I have to find the right identifier that they attribute to me, the right number they have in the system, but I have no 
way of establishing these numbers. So it's another problem. I would mm. love to talk to somebody who tried with effect, talking to Axiom or Oracle about their data, what sort of identifier was effective. Mm -hmm. and, be and because so-called first-party data, <laughs> data about you has become so, so valuable, it's another privacy problem because that's how companies are trying to evade the GDPR. Companies like Coca-Cola, for example, will upload all the data about you and give it to, f to Facebook so they can target you on, on Facebook and they learn much more about you. So the system is beyond data brokers now. It involves the global Fortune 1000 and others. <laughs> A rejoiner, then yes, I will uh, take the, the new person. The so part so of the problem yeah. trying to fix your, the rectification and the accuracy is that you have to provide more data. So Experian, they have a massive data breach. Yeah, right. <laughs> they contact people, they say, well, we can fix this, but the way to fix it is to actually, for you to give us even more information <laughs> on the, the one we wrote, and I think that's a fundamental problem. Because if you, do, you could use articles or three other articles and combine several GDPR articles, you know, with information, rectification, profile, to build a system that works, but then you will give them even more information because you will tell them what is actually truth. So you are not a female conservative. You know? I'm very happy to, yeah. to, to look like that on yeah. Facebook, actually. <laughs> um, it's part of my agency. Please. Uh. Yeah, just a quick answer I work for the EFF. Um, <coughs> a question with regards to this, um, the issue of uh, user uh, information subject access requests. Mm -hmm. So Article 14 2F also requires the disclosure of the sources of information where they did not originate from the controller. I'm curious to hear if you believe that the, that companies are just going to try to some, find some way to work around this, mm -hmm. um, or is this going to be some legal theory whereby if you make that access request to Facebook, well, they don't hold that information because they perhaps only it perhaps is only used in a specific moment during the launching mm. process. Or, I mean, basically, will, RT, will Article 14 to provide enough uh, reach in order for us to look inside the system to see exactly the type of obscure connections which you weren't able to access, for example, when you tried to do your experiments with, mm -hmm. um, with Panoptica? Yeah. I mean, I'm more than happy to try. I'm sure we, we all um, we should coordinate, basically, our legal attempts to use all those mechanisms available at GDPR soon enough so we get some results this year this calendar year uh, to some extent i believe that can be effective but only to some extent because my understanding of the behavioral advertising ecosystem is that it's not actually based on data transfers i mean facebook is not actually receiving data from oracle yeah. it's uh, they cooperate in a different way so in the milliseconds they are targeting me when i go online all this gets somehow dragged into one profile, but there are no, that's my understanding, actual data transfers between the companies. They are not actually trading with data. They're only cooperating to combine the best profile. Uh, if they do it that way, it will be very limited. Uh, we will not be able to, to make that point because that point is actually, uh, 14F uh, is, is, is based on the premise that you transfer data mm. and you are the, becoming the data processor. <laughs> It, be, if I can, there's probably a difference there between the actual <coughs> real-time production process and what well, Jeff. Yes, exactly. The uploading of custom, uh, CRM yeah. database. This, exactly. The multiple yeah. ways they CRM data in need to be, needs to be examined. I think, yeah. I Please. think the key we do several projects to sort of like investigate how access rights currently work and I'd love to talk more with anybody who's interested in this mm -hmm. but the, the first finding so far is that it's, it's, it's a joke currently and the main find will be about what is the definition of personal data because if you do a request currently to Google or Facebook they say hi thanks for reaching out we have this tool on our website where you can download all our data and I know that's not all of the data. No. And the same with like sort of like if you contact yeah. an app, they send you five information, whereas the privacy policy says that they collect IP right. addresses and we know IP addresses. So it's a struggle of collectively working together, finding out what, what each of these companies identifier is and then making the argument each time that this is personal information. Mm -hmm. So this is the struggle. I think that's, that's the first step before even finding out who's being shared with and collaborated with. Even that is a, is okay. a huge fight in and of itself. Yeah. To we, argue. We, we carried out a cross-country research with the, in the framework of a FP7 project. Uh, Ivan was part of, of the same uh, consortium and we carried out around eight countries in Europe uh, um, asking for our personal data and uh, 
it's it's very difficult to even to do it. Sometimes it's very difficult to even identify who should you contact if you stop speaking about big platform and you go like in the street with camera, CCTV camera. In, in Oslo, it was extremely difficult for me to to to, to get to know who was the data controller. Uh, it boils down to templates, to very very practical things that do not look fancy, but they are so important in the everyday life when you do it. And when we receive the information from Facebook for example, or from Twitter, it was very difficult for me to, to process this information or to make sense of that information. Yeah. And I will shift that into a question. And I, I also, in principle, wish to see the 14,000 different uh, profile or, or, or tags that are associated to my uh, profile, but I cannot make sense. I lack the, 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 the tools to make sense. I don't have the time to make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we do not take into consideration this asymmetry, in computing power yeah. or in making sense mm -hmm. of what the algorithm does mm -hmm. it's like it's we're only halfway in in trying to get the yeah. transparency of the yeah. algorithm yeah, you're right. and there is also collective elements that I, I really like your i don't know enough the details of your project but i really like the need to pass through the collective to try to understand also the individual position because otherwise like i will be just in an avalanche of information about myself not very useful often to me because i cannot act upon them True. If I can add on this, but I will first. I know that I'm abusing my position already, so I'll, mm -hmm. I'll I'll give first the floor to people that have not spoken yet, and then I'll come back. You were first, and then. Can you say something on this because I would like to just say something on the on the filter bubbles. Okay. Uh, like uh, down. I would like to come back to the profile in the real time, just to keep common. Um, so I'm also a computer scientist, and uh, I was wondering. If you manage to find which identifier this company are using when they are combining those two private profiles in real time into one, if you find those identifiers, let's say it would help you to find them, will you be able to use these identifiers to actually contact the company and use the GDPR uh, article which one? 14, uh, for example. Uh, to actually get to the information back from those companies? Yes. 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 You should be able to. The With the limitation that Federica described. In the fact that it's often hashed, it's often hashed in a way that can be easily re-identified, which then would be personal data, but then you actually have to make that point. So sometimes, which maybe you have to go with privacy impact assessment or something, there, there have to be different angles, but the oftentimes there are certain normalization techniques, at least yeah. currently, which we would say, hmm, that's not actually, yeah. that's not actually effective. So they would be protecting themselves at this point. But, but they respond sometimes, like, uh, like it's, I think that there's many reasons why it can go wrong, uh, but it, it can work and it can also not work. It's sometimes as a political, I think that well, at some point Europe will receive an avalanche of uh, data access uh, requests uh, and, and, and then it was more a political statement, so to say, and the political message that was sent about uh, beware, we exist, we keep you under accountability or like we want more accountability than, than the impact of Fitch single data access request. So because they don't exchange identifiers, they exchange either hashes or codes, you know, but they get for privacy pres pre preservation, they actually don't send emails across. You know, so it's not but they're the cross device IDs and, and even though they claim it's, it's not personally identifiable in their own literature, it's about targeting individuals. Mm -hmm. Right? Google has their own ideas. Yeah, and, 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 and all the cross-device companies are doing it, and so the big WPP, the biggest advertiser, has a cross-device ID of tens of millions of people getting those requests. Cross-device ID, who are they? They know. Please, and then... Uh, so, I will play the devs advocate uh, role. Uh, so, you, you said that you will... You would, like, you would like to be uh, the one that decides about the, which bubble to follow, you know? Uh, yeah, or in which bubble to, to be uh, targetized. Uh, what if I'm, I'm Facebook and I say, yeah, it's true that we, we changed our newsfeed rules, so pages I mean, now uh, we'll have to pay to be, to be shown. But also, I, I tell you that you can change, and you just have the, the, the normal timeline and just uh, chronologically it works and you can do the same with Twitter. So that's actually you have the, the you, you don't know that you can do it because nobody knows about what she can, he or she can do it on the setting on Facebook, but actually there is the, the way. So what, what if I, yeah. I'm the, the way of doing what exactly? 
you can just change the, the your timeline. So see, I want to see again like yesterday uh, all the all the pages and all the people okay. I follow, and in an chronological way. So not what it could what, uh, the posts that are more like that have more like no. or more uh, shares and so on. And that's my question. What is that's your point that it's possible. But, uh, if I tell you that, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> people don't know, but you can do it. Well, and I'm a company, and I want to. Uh, and I want to, you know, I, I have business to, to run, so if I think that this way, uh, in this way I will uh, earn more money because people need, uh, a company will need to advertise more to be shown, uh, it's, you know, liberty, my freedom to conduct a business. Well, I mean, I, I've heard, the, I, I, I think I know which setting you refer to, and I know, again, uh, experiments proving that it's it's not it's not actually working that way. I mean, you still get manipulated newsfeed even if you make an effort in the settings offered right now to say only my friends or only whatever. I want to see the top of my newsfeed only from my friends. Uh, from I, I'm not heavy Facebook user. I only go there when I have to advertise something uh, in public, uh, <laughs> like event. Like, so I, I, I cannot. Panoptic on Bumble. <laughs> it sounds very wrong. <laughs> So I haven't done it myself, those experiments, but I've heard critical comments. So, but if the alternative to being profiled would be from Facebook, for example, we are no longer profiling you. Are you happy? Yes, that's good alternative. I don't trust that they give us this alternative, but as long as, my point is, as long as they profile us on the basis of personal data, I would like as individual to have control over this process. If they stop doing this, so they drop at me a uh, news feed, which is not profile at all, which I doubt they do. I, I actually, I'm pretty sure Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't allow that because it's counter uh, against his business model. But if they did so, and it was honest, yes, that would be the response. That would be, a, 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 at least in legal terms, it would be a good response. We are no longer profiling you. Are you okay with this? Yes. But if they profile us, as individuals, we should be able to look into the logic of this and the data, personal data used in this process. Yes, so okay. that, that's the alternative. I see two hands there. Please, uh, first you. Um, so there's also, I mean, looking ahead to the future, there's a lot of development in, in privacy-preserving technologies for computation, like secure multi-party computation, you know, ways to compute things in an encrypted format between more of them than one party. If I was Facebook, or if I was a big uh, firm and I was looking at current data protection law, I would note that um, a lot of the profiling practices would prevent users getting access to data about them. If you hash it quickly, if you process it in a privacy-preserving manner between uh, people, you can get the analytics out, you can have, in effect, fine-grained micro-targeting without uh, falling outside of not all provisions of the GDPR, but many parts of the GDPR mm -hmm. designed to stop that. So I'm just wondering, if, if we really look forward to the future, which parts of the world need to change? Do we need to approach profiling as a complete activity separate from personal data? and think of it that way, or do we need to keep the link together and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it, this is a comment to both of you. Um, there is no neutral way to present anything. It's always political, and there's always, even chronological has its own biases, etc. Um, the difference though is, or the argument is, those are spaces uh, in which people learn about the world, and learn about politics, uh, that are used by so many people that they are more than just um, neutral platforms, they are a political space. Yeah. And this is why, even if you're a business, you can say you can go somewhere else, sure. There are network effects, but sort of like because this is such a crucial space in which so many different things, not just communication, happen, you have a responsibility to be transparent about what it is that you're doing. And that brings me back to the second part, and that is even if you're compliant with laws, um, if you're targeting messages based on profiles, um, even if in the act of profiling you're privacy <coughs> preserving, I think it is extremely important that I know how I'm being targeted. And I think it's not just ads, the, what I said before, discrimination in advertisement, or just abusive advertisement. The case where, um, Facebook talked about targeting vulnerable teenagers. Mm. I want to know if I'm targeted when I'm depressed, feeling low mm -hmm. and miserable about myself, because that's exploitative. Right. And 
the, the demand would be that you have to reveal this or there has to be a way for me to opt out and to say, I do not want to be targeted in this way. And there needs to be just greater, I mean, I think getting to the p political use is the most important, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but it's also you know, vital to uh, force a public debate and have the regulators look at how Facebook and Google are being used in, in other sensitive data categories. So right now, for example, Facebook is building out a whole health and pharma ad targeting system designed to specifically influ influence your health decisions where that data, of course, will also be fed into the political sector. There's no oversight going on, on the United States on that, and it needs to be. Mm -hmm. A really interesting point, just to reinforce your point, I think I, I fully agree, it would be very interesting to see the effects of regulation that goes after profiling for reasons described right now by Frederica and not exactly on pers based on personal data. So far we only have, uh, the only angle we have is to make a point against Facebook based on personal data. We cannot make the general point that you are simply having great impact on people's life by profiling content in general, even if you don't use personal data, but you use your general knowledge about the world. For example, you know that, I don't know, at 6 p.m. in Europe, people are more vulnerable than at 6 a.m., whatever. In fact, it would be great to, to get them more transparent simply on profiling, not just on profiling using personal data, but right now we have what we have, that's why we try to refocus on this angle. But I fully agree that would be a great next step. I have quite still a few questions. There was a rejoinder there, please. Yeah. Uh, so and so then. So I know. Just I know. Question, At various times, there have been comments about you know, the need to be able to control the profile or to understand why you're being targeted. And that can seem to me to, to poke at either. Is it the underlying data that you have the right to understand the, the criteria upon which you're being profiled? Or is it kind of the, the weighting of those criteria? And kind of the secret sauce is to how they're putting those all together? Or is it both? So I'd like to kind of understand wh where you guys are coming on from mm -hmm. that. Okay. A short reply, if you want, or we can go to the other questions. Can I say good one? Sorry? Can I reply to that one? Yeah, Short that's right. Ah, one. absolutely. It was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, long, uh, the, the shortest version is all of, all of the things you mentioned. Yes. <laughs> uh, although there is a serious chance that it will be limited in practice and in the future jurisprudence, it still has to happen, so this is speculation. But it may end up in your data no, okay. and the way the secret sauce is applied to your data. But I don't see much room for shrinking the scope of that right access further than that. Thank you very much. There was a question there. Uh, I want to ask you if it made for liabilization a private level or, or why not uh, international standards for uh, the quality of uh, the, um, uh, the security that the consumer are waiting for? For, the, or the for programs or companies who we are working with, we can imagine that sometimes we saw that for, um, uh, like for Apple in America, we hear that they want to prove that they, they are respecting private uh, uh, privacy for, for the, some, some you know, I didn't remember in which case. And um, in fact, Apple was fighting very much to not give their code to, to the CIA. Or to San Bernardino the case. All right, it was and I know it's another problem, but uh, it's about security. We have some not so far. And uh, um, I, I think that it would be interesting to see if we can not use the same elementary uh, uh, key just uh, to, to, to fight about that. Um, I think that that would be interesting to, to, to promote. Uh, then we, we know which, which one we are working on. Just, just briefly, we need global safeguards. We need global safeguards because it shouldn't just be the, the, the EU that has it. If you look at these systems, and I think Frederica said, I mean, there's a good Facebook, somebody has a case study about the Philippines, maybe Google or Facebook in the election. This is being deployed, all, the system is all over the world, Africa, South America, Asia. There's, there's not as much regulation, and right now the companies are lobbying the trade deals, right? The WTO and all, to, to exempt all these data practices from regulation. And that's another threat that we have. It's a, it's, a, it's a preemptive strategy to make sure we don't put regulatory data protection safeguards into the digital system. 
made me comment about self-regulation. What's very f my favorite website is youronlinechoices.com because it's the safe self-regulation website of the European yeah. online advertisers, and it's interesting to read uh, because it's it, it explains what kind <coughs> of myths the current advertisement the system IAB EU. is built around exactly. And the first myth is we only track you through cookies. We know that's not true. Yeah. Because um, and cookies you can block, but tracking has advanced beyond cookies. And the second myth is. This is all anonymous, so you don't have to worry. Can I add something? If you haven't looked at it, go look at the uh, 2017 IAB EU Awards. Each year they give awards and they have the case studies. And look at all the ways that the IUB, IAB EU members collect data on you. It's amazing. At the same time, though, I think this is the, the problem is they are, it's very difficult to even understand what's happening and to, to, for, for there to be any sort of accountability self-regulation doesn't work. There is the idea of there are advertisement standards and ethical guidelines, but if you don't know how you're being targeted and profiled, there's no way, there's zero accountability as to whether these practices are exploitable. No, there, I mean... The, I, 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 I see that you are afraid of the actor of the government, but the government has the same problem because slowly they come inside the, the public organization by the connection of private and, and, uh, and professional data that they catch by Google or anything. Uh, I suppose that, the, 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 yeah, the main approach we, we take is that, we are, I mean, <laughs> there is such a huge discrepancy of interests between companies doing this and citizens that I don't see how they could, in honest way, self-regulate with the values that we have in mind, mm -hmm. uh, with the same values. It's, it's simply open war. Um, right. I mean, we are treated as commodity right now, not as humans. and. To, to become human in this conversation is very difficult. If I can make a brief point on, 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 on the question about what should be revealed, of course we want as much as possible, but it's a, a, a big question of how we will interpret the logic behind profiling, how it will be translated in uh, tech, in, in, in the exact information given to us. Uh, I think what, what, what goes without saying is that we want the categories of data used. That's, that's easy. We want sources of this data. Mm -hmm. We want to understand uh, value attributed to this data. So, yeah. for, for example, if there are 100 categories on me, how they are uh, weighed, what, what's the, what, yeah, I mean, what's the impact of each of those categories on the final decision, whether they all have the same weight or not, for example. But if we go beyond the simple um, simple equation, I don't know, five features, different weights, mix of those five features results in certain result. From what I understand in algorithmic decision making, it's hardly ever that simple. Uh, we go into the mm. world of neur neur neuronal networks, uh, machine learning, all this complicated stuff. Here, the companies usually say we cannot reveal the logic because we are not able to reverse engineer the logic that was applied by, by the machine. Uh, so that argument, we, we have to kill this argument. How? I think it's extremely important that we find the answer, maybe in some, or some form of the workshop mm -hmm. or, or meeting with computer engineers. But, but one way to do it is to get the ad insertion order. The ad insertion order coming from the big companies, coming from the big ad agencies representing the political campaigns, for example, or any other marketers, will tell you exactly what the goal was and what techniques and these ad insertion orders and that's one of the things we have to force mm -hmm. Facebook to in fact file when they when they make publicize the ads what was the intent when they say we don't know a secret sauce they have been told what to do they get paid to deliver okay the intention uh, it, it can be the easiest thing mm -hmm. one, one comment though there is a difference point. between profiling and automated decision making they're not the same thing mm -hmm. and i remember vividly from the working party uh, fab lab discussions that there were discussions about whether targeted ads are an automated decision not. it's not quite clear if somebody has better information i'd love to hear it it's not very clear what is clear though is that they are based on data about you and data that has been generated yeah, through yeah, but the programmatic environment, which is really what delivered the fake news, is it is both automatic decision yeah. and a profiling system integrated into one. That's now cross device. I agree. Yeah. I agree, but, but, but it's legally it's not maybe okay. legally, it's yeah. not very I have to do the the most terrible thing that is to to to, to, to 
close this session and the no. most beautiful no, we were just going to turn to you to, Rocco and thank to, you to, for to thank you for participation <laughs> thank you guys uh,